Welcome back to the Offside Podcast. We're here with the team. We've got Andy here, Tom and Junior, and myself. Uh, we're supposed to deliver last night. We just had some technical difficulties, but um, here we are on a Friday on a very cold Auckland day. Uh, how is everyone doing? Good. Great. Someone's great? Siki? Like that. Uh, excuse my sniffling nose. It's a very Kiwi thing, so you guys are just going to have to deal with it. Um, this is our sports podcast, and uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk to a little bit about uh, as a professional, as a former professional rugby player, as some of the best players that he played with, but I also wanted to pick his brain about his top 15. Now I've got mine in 15, and someone's going to check in his 15. Hey, bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <man. Okay. laughs> um, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. But, uh, Ali, man, like, your top 15 players that you that you played with or that, that's just in your team. Yo. Okay, um, my my prop, man, I don't know, the, the loose head or the toe head, but the number one, I'm going to go with uh, Suwane uh, Tongahuya. Ah, oh, yes, uh, from the Tongue team. Big bold guy that they helped defeat the French. Yes. Yeah, uh, that's a big one that people forget is that Tongue team of 2011 beat the French team, and the French team went on in the final and nearly beat the All Blacks. Yeah. The exact same team. So, um, no, no I, I also. Was lucky enough to uh, be on the same team as Sawane in Auckland. Mm. Yeah, and um, what's he like? He was amazing, bro. He was amazing. He was St. Peter's College. I am St. Peter's. Uh, big player, big ball runner, um, awesome scrummager. And I was so glad that he got the career that he got overseas because um, mm. a lot of a lot of Auckland players they either don't make it in Auckland or don't get given the chance, and they have to go. You, you see, like um, Aaron Swift is one. You know, there's. So many players who have gone down the line or gone overseas to try and further their careers. And he was one of them who left, mm. or left young and he had a great career uh, with Northampton in England and with Tonga. Yep. Rugby World Cups and stuff. And um, he was a mean player. Bro. He was opposing too. He was massive. He was massive. Awesome ball runner. Like, you know, I think New Zealand went to a stage of like um, scrummaging props. Yeah. And then these big island boys started carrying the ball and offloading. And he was one of the first. And um, yeah, bro. That's your number one? Yeah, that's my number one. Who's yours? Uh, I'm probably going to go a bit older than that, probably a decade older. Um, but I grew up uh, watching Orland Brown. Um, and there was always the quote that his, his back was as straight as a team. Mm. And he couldn't move him. Um, and my brother's were, well, my brother Lionel was a prop, so he kind of modeled his game after him. Mm. And a lot of young funny boys did. Like, he was almost unmovable in that position. Um, but yeah, I'd throw it in front. Like, another Auckland boy, another Auckland Salmon boy too. Oh. Who's your number two? Okay, uh, to be honest, who's your number two first? <laughs> I had to go Kevin. Yeah. 100 caps for the All Blacks. Um, man, and that early Auckland team, it was kind of weird to see a small hooker mm. that was so fast but competitive with everyone in the front. Yeah. And he was just like, just around the fringes, the way that he would pick and go. Mm. So. So you, that's that's my number. Uh, that's a good pick. Um, I just want to say that Marmi Swalga, mm. probably the best captain I've ever been under. And if I had to go with captaincy as a very important part, then I'd probably pick him. At, okay, um, he was also captain for the Chiefs when they won it twice. That's right. So um, and there's a lot of shit that Manu Samo players have to go through just to play, and Fiji and Tongan players have to go to three just to play. So um, shit. I'll probably go Kevin as well, but. Manu's right there, but Kevin. There's an advocacy um, element to Manu because he's not only being high level in sports, but he's dealing with the levels outside of the game. Yeah, and that's why he ended up finishing. Like he he spoke up against a lot of the problems in Samoa, that you know, with the chairman and stuff, and he never got picked again. So there was a few of us who never got picked again, and that affects your chances of the Hall of Fame or all of that shit. You know, yeah, it's because you can't play anymore or you're blacklisted or whatever. And so he lost his spot. He spoke up and he was on John Campbell as well. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't he go back to Samoa and started helping out? In yeah, so he runs the um, Rugby Academy Samoa. Yep. Less. Um, he's one of the only players who have actually done something. I've done something. I've, I've been doing clinics as well. I did clinics for a long time. And then he came and did his one. And But his one's still going. Yep. Um, it's, it's awesome. Like there's nothing else. There's nothing else consistent. Uh, the union are now picking up their game, probably because he's part of the union now. Yeah. Uh, coaching Manu Samo, but Manu Samo players have a lot of shit to fight off the field, and like it affects everything on the field. 
And so if, when I pick my 15, I always think about that, like mm. sacrifices they have to make and, um, and shit that they have to go through. So, And this is good because I'm an observer. I'm mm. just a fan. Yeah. Like you're in the trenches, you've been in the trenches. So it's good because we get, we get the, I guess, your typical comment section 15 versus someone who's actually been in there with these guys. But that's not to take away anything. Like Kevin, man, I played against Kevin when he was at um, Oda Hoop. Yeah. So that was back when the All Blacks played club rugby. And he's been amazing for, like you said, 100 test matches. Yeah. Just an amazing player. And, man, uh, yeah, I'll probably go with Kevin if it was uh, just play. He's your number three. Number three is probably a bit biased, but um, I got Census Johnson. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Census Johnson, um, I respect, again, what he did. We were in um, Auckland High Performance Unit together, and he capped it early. So there was a really elite group, including nearly everyone went on to be an All Black, and Census didn't stick around for it. He, um, he went to be a Ritz really early. Uh, we, we know, he, was, he was chasing the coin, and he had an amazing career with his getting money. So... I really respect what he did. He had the guts to go and go overseas before most of us. E. And um, awesome career for Samoa. Again, he was in the trenches with us off the field, trying to fight uh, corruption in the union and in the world rugby. He's, he's always been supportive of um, my battles. But in rugby, bro, he was he was amazing, man. He was knocking over everybody really fast. Yeah. Fast runner, big size. Um, yeah. Amazing play. Who have you got? Oh, well, actually, I'll call my number three. And I don't know if this is the right position or not, but um, Tony Woodcock. <laughs> Boring. <laughs> hey, man. I'm Bro, that's boy. one of the clamps. He's a clamp. He's a clamp in it. He's my old boy. I have to. Yo. My mom, like, again, it's a debate with a lot of um, people because everyone champions Stephen Don, who's a Wesley boy. Um, Chiefs, Chief player, but they always talk about that 2011 World Cup of New Zealand. And they're always like, oh, Stephen Donald Samuel. So I'm like, nah, the guy who scored the try, the prop, that's the guy that got us on the board first. So I don't know, like, I've always had an affinity for him. Also, because I played the same position soon. Oh, yeah. It's from the time. Who are your locks? Locks. You're going to hate mine if we. <laughs> <laughs> I know one, is it? Naka, Nakawara, is it? Nakawara, yeah. Nakawara, the Fijian. Yeah. Yeah. Just offloading again, Fijian. <laughs> Um, but he wasn't, like, my reason is that he was in the World 15s a few times. Yeah. And it's really hard for a Pacific player to make the World 15s. You know, there were some years where we played three test matches and the All Blacks and Australia would play 15 or 14 test matches. Like, AJ. like how, how do you even be seen? You know, you're playing three test matches against, like, other Pacific teams while Tijuana are playing so many games a year. And for him to be consistently making the World 15s, and he was a hell of a player as well, so, um, again, um, in spite of all the obstacles and challenges, like, um, I think he's had a great career and he was a wonderful player as well. Who's yours? He's on a good boring again. <laughs> I've got John Hills. Oh! <laughs> John Hills, sorry, I'm, I'm an old head. Um, but I actually got to work with him. So there's kind of like a, you know, he was at Discovery Channel. I'm... So, no, nah, I, just, I just thought he was the all, I guess, your typical, um, like, Aussie bloke, but in a nice way. He was a bit more progressive. Uh, he did a documentary on the hacker. He always talked about how he was a more of it, or him and that group of Australian, that Wallabies team in the late 90s, early 2000s were on War Hut. Um, we have had other teams in the past kind of just, like, try and prick their chests up or they get the crowd singing. He was always in support of... I guess that that culture aspect, but again, beating the All Blacks is just no hard kind of feat, and he did that to win a World Cup as well. So, yeah, dude was a goal kicker as well. Eh? He was yeah. a goal kicker as well. So there was that kind of freakish element where he was jumping, he was kicking goals. I mean, New Zealand had that was in Zambrook, mm. I think. Um, but not taking the shots at goal. Not taking. And the I think he took a shot to win it as well. Like, you know, I can't do was clutch for it. it was ice in the veins, so man. No, well, I think he's he's on most people's. 10, 15, too. Oh, nice pick. I'm also showing my age here, too. So. Uh, or depth. Or, or depth. Or depth. Your, your depth of knowledge. Depth. Uh, who's your second lock? Uh, Brody Retellet. Yeah. And I think he's just, he's unreal, man. And he's been a difference in games as well. 
a lot of games and he's huge. He's like, usually we talk about six, seven, what, he's like six, eight, six, yeah. nine. Um, he's hard, bro. He's hard. He's an old school, hard um, Kiwi dude. Um, it's rare to have that type of throwback player on yeah. Friday today. It's really rare, really rare. And especially now where like the tall guys, it seems like it's really hard for them because now they got to get lower for the tackles and stuff, you know, accidental head knocks is a red card now. And so there's a lot more challenges for um, for them. They're a bit lucky nowadays, so, you know, you're allowed to lift. Whereas uh, if you're comparing them with an older player like Colin Meads, you weren't allowed to lift. So, you know, line out now that sort of takes out any debate in line outs. Yeah. So, um, but around the field, well, he's, he's bad. He's bad. My um my lock pick would be Ali Williams. <laughs> I knew that was coming. Right. That, um, guy. <coughs> that guy and his stories. You know him on a personal level. No, I I I've met him a few times, but did you read his book? No. Where he talked about some of the parties. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not privy to that. I'm privy to his own field. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, now again, there was a season, I think it was 2002 or 2003. That Auckland Blues team were at the at the top, and um, he was part of that. He was, I think, for that year, the, the lock of the year. Um, but yeah, just like character-wise, um, it's nice to see rugby players that are not the the uh, full credit to the boys. <laughs> yes. And he was one of the earlier forwards that was just a kind of um, just was himself. Mm. Um, and not that he was just a great player too. I think Nick and Nick at the All Blacks at the time was Chris Jack and Harding Williams for that time period, and now. No versus Crusaders, it's always going to be walking. So, uh, yeah, that was my pick. Yeah, I remember sitting in a meeting with Ali Williams and they asked him what his goal was for the year and he said he was going to be an all black and all of, all of the young Polynesian players, including myself, went, yeah, oh, sh whatever. And, bro, he, he did it. You know, yeah. he, he had that self belief and I never forget that. It was something that we lack. And, uh, but he had it. He had it. And, yeah, he had a break. And I love that. Like, it's, yeah. That's a, uh, I mean, that could be classed as maybe... For us, it is, eh? Yeah. Then that's how we reacted. We were yeah. like, what an eat us. Because we've been conditioned to think that's lowly right. of yeah. ourselves. Yeah, you said low expectations yeah. and, and low and confidence. And, yeah. and also we've been taught to slam anyone who does think that. Because yeah. that's what our reaction was. <laughs> what an eat us. And it's almost double mm. the time. It's almost double the effect when you're a persona. Guy. Like we talked mm. about um, Lani Lomapi saying, I'm the mm. best 12 in this country. Shut up. Bro, and the amount of hate that he even got from his own people yes. was just like, yo, like if this guy believes it, and statistically he was. He, he was amazing. He's had an yeah. amazing career. Maybe that's what we're missing. Yeah. Is that self-belief, that last 10%. Well, you get it from Jerome White, mm. um, Critter, all yeah. those Penrith players, those Pacific boys, like absolutely hate them as much as you want. But those guys are saying, no, we're the best. And they're and they're there. Yeah. So maybe stop thinking small of yourselves. Think big of yourselves, speak yourself into, manifest it, and it'll manifest in you running hills and all of this because you try and back your words. Yeah. And then the, wor the best thing is talking shit on the field, but the worst thing is when you're shit. You know, <laughs> so you have to back, it's always the hardest thing. Yeah. That's why I think the bravest players will always speak their shit because they know you gotta back that shit. Yeah. It's easy to back something small when you've not said anything. So you're coming out of nowhere. That's easy because. It's only a little standard you got to achieve, but when you're telling everyone you're the best, it forces you to be the best. Yeah. And I think that's what's missing is that we don't speak ourselves. We don't manifest our, our potential. We don't speak our potential and consequently we don't manifest it. So Ali Williams, I'll never forget. I still remember right now, we're all young and you said it was going to be an all black. We all laughed and you became an all black. And maybe that's what we were missing when we were young. The usual, um, well, this is contentious and I struggled with this very briefly, but the, Six, seven, and eight combo, super important in, in the makeup of rugby, uh, all round. Who have you got as your six? Yeah, this was hard, man. This was hard. Um, I think of Jerry Collins. I think of uh, what he went through, and I remember meeting him a lot. Of, and he wanted to play for Mung Samoa as well. I did of his career. Um, I actually thought a lot about um, Theodore McFarland because he's my he's the the dream six. But I don't think he's done enough to obviously um, be in that position. But I ended up with um, Sione Lawaki. Hey, wax. Wax. I ended up with Sione Lawaki. I was fortunate enough to play against him in the age groups and in Cod Rugby when he played for Waitemata and they won the Gala Shield. 
I was fortunate enough to play with him in the Auckland uh, reps and stuff. And then to see him again leave Auckland, because he was behind like Angus McDonald, he was behind uh, Braid. And so he left Auckland and to see him play the way he played and just what an amazing player. And everything big, strong, intelligent, offloads, all of that. Four offloads was a thing. Um, he would be. Uh, he would be my that son. that fend of his way is remarkable. Like you don't you don't um, throw world class flankers around. Richie McCaw, like arguably the greatest. He face counted. Yeah, <laughs> like it was nothing, and and that's what Wakes was. Yeah, he would just turn it on whenever he wanted to, and hilarious, really fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah, crack up. Yeah, just a brilliant mind. He was really weird, just intelligent. Um, Man, rest in peace. He was, a, he was an amazing player. You sure? Um, I went Jerry Collins. Safe. I went Jerry Oh, no, no. <laughs> uh, it's interesting, eh? Because so my brothers, they played in the same age group and they always said, like, even before Super Rugby was a thing, because, like, back in those days, like, high school rugby, like, you'd go to the games, right? And so the name whispered around Auckland was Jerry yeah. Collins. Because yeah. I think we had the rival number eight at our school, forgot his name. Um, um, but they were always talking about, oh, this guy down from Wellington, Jerry Connors, he's like, he's the next big thing. And he came up to, I think they had like some sort of like, it was either a trial or something. And he absolutely demolished the number eight from Auckland. He absolutely demolished, but um, he ended up playing at the sixth position. Um, funny story about Jerry, and I, you probably got hit on heaps. He used to frequent the clubs when he used to come up and play for Wellington. And so it wasn't, it wasn't uncommon to go see him at the club and he would be by the bar by himself and he would just shout everyone drinks. He wouldn't bother anyone. He was just sitting there having a good time. And on two occasions, I remember, I think with B-Bar was one, where I just rocked up and everyone, like, this is before cell phones, so you couldn't really take selfies. But it's just like, oh, want to be next to Jerry. So I went and shook, shook his hand and he went and shouted me and my mates, like, all oh, drinks. And it's just like, I don't know, nothing. Like, yeah. just chilling there, drinking. Um, yeah. And I like seeing that outside of the sport where they're not like, I guess the perception for a lot of athletes or celebrities, you can kind of get the pompous attitude, but... He felt very much like a salmon boy. Yeah. Um, and obviously on the field, mm. destructive as hell. What a, I like him. Do you have any stories about Jerry? Oh, yeah, there's all of those. All these <laughs> interesting stories. I think everyone has been sharing it as well when he uh, passed away. Yeah. There were a lot of good stories about him, but the one that stuck out with me most is that he wanted to play for Mungu Samu. He, he said it a lot. Um, he encouraged me to keep fighting the rules because. Um, because of that, because he felt he was Samoan and, uh, and spoke Samoan. And um, yeah, th that's the one that sticks with me is that uh, he encouraged me to keep fighting those rules because he wanted to play for Mama Samoan. Oh, um, yeah. Rest what a piece to go. Who's your number seven? I'm old school, bro. I'm old <laughs> school. I'm old school. It's Michael Jones for me. Mm -hmm. Michael Jones was uh, a hero to a lot of us 80s kids. Um, what a player, man. If you ever are fortunate enough to see his footage when he was playing seven. When he was playing seven. Um, and back then, like he was a, like the number one line out option as well as people don't know. Like they had to jump back then. And because there was no lifting, eh? There was no lifting. And because he was basketball, like Fitzpatrick would always hit him at the back. Guaranteed win all the time. And that's gone out of the game now. So, wow. freak. Yeah, he was awesome, man. Like all around the field, super fit. I uh, had a game for Mumisa Amor, right? Um, played for Viola as well in Samoa before he was an All Black. Um, to me, he's the greatest. Richie McCaw is unbelievable. I'm not going to take anything away from him, but uh, childhood hero was Michael Jones. And I appreciate him more, actually, with the rule changes in that, you know, players not having to know how to win a line out now. You can be lifted. You don't have to jump. So I appreciate more what the older players uh, went through. And I appreciate more his skills with the line out, um, taking rucks, getting rucked in the face, and all of that. For me, it's Michael Jones, but I understand him when he says Richie McCall. Is there, um, mm -hmm. is there once in a lifetime athletes that come along in there? Like in the 90s, if you grew up in New Zealand, the word was Michael Jones, Michael Jones, because rugby was obviously a tradition, but there was almost like a, a guy that broke the rules in a sense, mm -hmm. that he was more athletic than everyone else, yes. more skilled, and he, you know, you could probably speak to this better than I did, but he actually like evolved the game. Right. 
like long moved it after him. Yeah. There was like involvement there, right? And back then, like uh, the training wasn't as intense now. So there was a lot of natural ability. Right. You know, and that's what what, what was a big separator of players. And, this is before professional, right? Yeah, before the professional, before they start bloody training eight-year-olds now, you know? Um, so he was just naturally gifted. And he was just bigger, stronger, many so white people off. Um, he was he was amazing. He was also the difference in a lot of test matches, especially against Australia, because there wasn't many games against South Africa back then. That's another thing. And um, he went missing on Sunday because church obligations. Yeah, 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 that's a good. And point. so Oblix would like lose a couple of games yes. because their key guy wasn't there. That's a good point, and he stayed true to that. Yeah. So you know, he had a, he had discipline, and he had a core belief, and he stuck by it no matter what. And the All Blacks stuck by with that stuck with it no matter what. Yeah. You know, usually now, you know, there's little, little undercover threats of, well, you know, that might cost, you know, maybe we're, we're going to give that spot to another player. But with him, it was always uh, up to you, up to you to look after him because he was everything. He was everything. Him and John Kerwin and that team, 1987 World Cup team were everything. That's a funny thing because we've, um, in our comment section on TikTok, people were talking, there's that debate of, um, you know, the women's soccer team, yeah. people were saying, leave your culture at home. Well, he left this culture at home and your team lost. Yeah, <laughs> this is one of the occasions where, no, he left the fact that culture, yeah. it's kind of get along with the player. Yeah. Um, my number seven, obviously, McCall. And I, I've told the story off camera, but I was pro Michael Jones for the longest of times. Um, but it's hard to kind of debate two World Cup wins in the bag. Um, even though he did have it's a, the rings, is it? It's the it, it is the Michael Jordan. It, it's the Michael Jordan's got six rings. <laughs> uh, McCall's got two rings. Uh, but he's but like, there's no World Cup uh, before the '87, so maybe Michael Jones would have had one. Well, he had the first one. So. Yeah, he got the first one. Um, but no, I, I'm a fan of his work. I always like it. I always like when um, I see other like countries and fans complain. Like some guys are so good that you just call them a cheater, <laughs> and and he. Kind of fit that mold like he was at the very closest of the well the edge of the rules basically mm. um and i think that's a score in itself but yeah, yeah for the longest time it was always michael jones but i was like you mm. just have to give it up and he's, to give it up. he's like the, is he like the only captain with a hundred wins as well i think so it's hundred international wins is crazy so as a captain and you see the clips of him like sweeping up the uh changing rings and shit after games like he was captain on and off the field uh, to lead uh, such a successful group of guys, yeah, bro. I, that's why, I like the Michael Jordan LeBron debate, I don't, mm. I don't disagree if anyone thinks McCaw. He, yeah, he's absolutely amazing, but for me, yeah, it's Michael Jordan. Stokes. Um, number eight, Wolves. Number eight was the first name I put in the fifteen. The easiest name, Henry Tuilangi. The butcher. Easiest, and I just wish there was more you. YouTube footage of him when he was young. So you've said this, um, and that's an interesting fact because we have on this side of the world, we've only got to see him through, obviously, the um, Heineken Cup and, and a lot of those. But there's, there's a world that has existed way before that. Yeah, but yeah for him and Brian Ma, Trevor Leota, the biggest hitters in the game, there's no footage from their peak years or even in their 20s, man. Yeah. And Henry Tuilangi was unbelievable. People go crazy over the, the footage that is there yeah. on the internet. When that's nothing? Yeah, that's nothing when he's old. He, he's in his like mid-30s, like he's coming on the down and people still bring it up. Man, he ran into Burger. It was unbelievable. Even Burger did a podcast about it. Yeah. Was speaking about, oh, he's a scariest man in rugby. That was when he was old. Imagine him in his 20s and his peak years, like 20. And that's what he was doing uh, in the English comp. He was writing everybody off, literally destroying teams, destroying players by himself, he was the most unbelievable player. I, I've never seen a player like him. Like, just straight, but fast, massive. Did he play any positions prior to that, outside of the eight, or was he always an eight? I don't know. I don't know if he played winger. He could have played winger, because that whole family is fast. Yeah. Like, the Tui Lungi family, and I'll say it, like, they're the greatest rugby family in the world. And you ask him who's the fastest. I asked Alexander who's the fastest, and he says, oh, it's Julie, the, the, the Fafa finger brother. Oh, right. Yeah, so True. she's also like 6'5", um, super fast. And well, I mean, she's chasing them all around, so... <laughs> but what a family. What a family. And Henry was was the same, but like he's thicker, but he was just as fast. Like He is a, um, visually a very scary human being. Like, if there's a body that's close to the Hulk, yes. 
<laughs> and he talks like this. He talks really high. <laughs> he's a really nice guy. Hey, what's up? What's up? And like, he's massive. And he's part of that generation, like the late hit generation, where you passed it and then you waited there. Both. You know, you can't do that now, but. Well, his target was already locked in. Well, it's already locked in. And as a drawn pass, you already knew it was locked in. So you had to pass and like elbow up, knee up, and just get ready. Um, like you see the clips, man. He's unreal at the old age. But man, I just wish it was more YouTube for him, for Brian Lima. Because the stuff they did is that cool stuff now. Yeah. You know, the, the smashing people, the riding them off, like dudes rolling around on the ground like uh, yeah. every game, every game. And it was allowed back then. You know, that that's what made rugby was so his hits, man. And he used to do it all the time. Like I was talking about when he might had about four or five a game, but we only <laughs> see the same South Africa hit he did. Like no, I mean, uh, we we grew up. He played for the Blues. Yeah, that's well, right. Yeah, yeah, and and then yeah. he was so good that they used to go, "All right, they're playing Jonah now. It's Brian Lima versus Jonah." Like that's how good Brian Lima yeah. was. Like he was in talks with Jonah, the greatest of all time, and he was seen as like the only one who could tackle Jonah because he was such a big hitter. Big hitter. Yeah. yeah. But for me, Henry Tulang, you'll never see a sprinter hitter anyone gonna sprint up like that, and especially like bowl over Berger and the South African. Lucy's who are huge every year they're huge and so for me that was easy the most entertaining the most electrifying rugby player <laughs> I, I mean you know what I wish I saw it because he yeah. probably would have been my 8-2 yeah. the guy that uh, I guess a lot of us grew up watching was in Zambok that's oh, my number 8 um, obviously Zanny again in that kind of same ilk as Leo's would just be kicking goals <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so sorry. <laughs> Come on, man. Uh, Sydney's the man. Uh, Zinzer Brook is the man. I'm Super rugby, NPC, Rafferty Shields. What a player. That's and, my and He brought, and after him was Ron Cripp, who was, yep. again, was a very good kicker, chip and chase. Yep. So that style came out for a bit. Yeah. Where it was a, a very skillful way. He was, yeah, a highly intelligent player. Who's your uh, number nine, Oz? Who's yours? <laughs> you might like mine. Um, Khan for oh, yeah. I chose Khan because uh, he chose Salmoa. Yes. And I, I believe that he would have been an All Black if and he wanted to. He had that choice. Um, yes. And I love that he chose Salmoa. Mm -hmm. He put Sal, like he, he put Salmoa first. Yeah. Not only that, he was amazing. <laughs> he was an amazing number nine. He was so oh, slick. He was so good looking. <laughs> you played with him, right? What's he yeah. like? What's the like? Nah, yeah. No, nah, that's that would be my my nine. I was a bit scared to say it, but... <laughs> no, he's... No, Khan Fotoli, he... Um, I remember, remember there were a few injuries for the All Blacks and he was lined up to be an All Black and he got the choice and he chose Samu. Yeah. And, um, yeah, but that meant that he had to go overseas. Mm. So, yeah. Um, so, for me, anyone who sacrifices for the All Blacks, I think there was another player, the Hurricanes winger. Um, but, yeah, sorry, but... I mean, those will be fat, huh? No, there was another player after Khan, but Khan was the first, I think, to choose Sarmour over the All Blacks. And that's massive, and it changed. And no disrespect to any of the halfbacks who played before or during that time, but like we beat Australia when Khan came, um, they beat Wales, uh, we came close to South Africa at the World, uh, World Cup. Like, that 9 10 axis is so important. And when Khan came, everything changed. Like, it seems like he's the type of player that you can put in any team and he will keep the 10. Yes. Yeah. Hey. No, yeah. And he's got like guts to just run the show. You know, no, no. I'm going to I'm gonna put the team on, on my back and if it fucks up, it's my back. E. You know, so he... So playing with him, you sort of like got to keep him off it a bit because he will dominate. But that's what we needed. We needed somebody who had the guts to like run the show. And when he came along with 2CPC, mm -hmm. right, that the most important positions, 9 and 10... Like beating Australia in Australia, the greatest one Manu Samuel's ever had was when he was at that nine for that game. Yeah. And um, man, anyone who picks Samoa over the All Blacks, that's a massive sacrifice. And, uh, and he did it. And he did it. And he did it successfully, I believe. He, yeah, he did something great for Samoa. You yeah. know, the, the success for Samoa is different for the success for the All Blacks. Yep. All Blacks won the World Cup in 2011. There was no parade or anything in Samoa for, for the Samoan players. We lost to South Africa in the same World Cup, but because we played awesome, 
They flew us back to Samoa, had parades the whole week. They were up on Saturday night after the game for the whole night. It meant everything to them. So there's a whole different vibe when you play from under Samoa and you do well. Like you literally can affect the whole, what do you call it? The whole feeling, the whole um, energy. Energy, yeah, the whole energy of the island changes. And so, but you've got to sacrifice, obviously, the money, the 10 grand a week you get with the All Blacks, the retainers and all of that stuff. And he did that and he did something special for our people. And um, I'll never forget that. Like, and he was a, he was a bad player. I mean, he was an unbelievable, awesome player for us. Is yeah. your number nine? That's my number nine. He, definitely, definitely. Who is your team? Larkin. See you at Larkin. Yeah. Just, um, ah, I hate that I picked a Balangi guy for the team. <laughs> um, Stephen Bishop is right up there for yeah. me. Um, he meant a lot, that, that 91 team that uh, beat Wales and nearly beat Australia, that beat Argentina. Jeez. Mm -hmm. um, Lucky was so smooth, though. Yeah, like him. Passing, man. Yeah, he's, uh, like you said, you know, he's like the, like Lucky and uh, just smooth, yeah. Yeah. gliding, just skillful and nothing much on his face, you know, you, like a poker player. He's not showing you much, highly intelligent. 6'3", 6'4", you know, tall. He was that yeah, he was tall, man. Oh, shut up. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I really liked watching him play. He was my favorite player, um, favorite back. Um, but Stephen Bishop is right up there. He did great things for Manu Sambo. Also became an All Black. That was back when you could switch. Yeah. And so the, um, him, Alama, Jeremia, and uh, Frank Bunce, all three of them went to the All Blacks after playing for Manu Sambo. Uh, Stephen Bishop was an amazing player, too. But yeah, his brother played nine. Where Basha for the All Blacks, yep. And I think they got, is it a nephew or a son now? Yeah, and the Hurricane squad, so. Might be surprised. Yeah, so, who's your team? Then you kind of. Carlos Spitzer, actually. Ooh. Yeah, <laughs> Carlos Spitzer, actually, he's uh, the grand wizard. <laughs> oh, the Mr. Man Toffee that Pops. The man that was. It's because um, of his body, yeah, you like oh. his body? <laughs> I love the Toffee Pops. <laughs> <laughs> his skills, man, like, at that era, like, I don't think you'll seen anything like what he was doing yeah. especially in a, a game that's so traditionally entrenched in heritage and playing this by the rules mm -hmm. um he was doing chip overs off his knee yes like he was doing kicks between his legs he was oh, passing yeah. between the legs he yes. was doing things that were so kind of off kilter that it made teams switch up and i think yeah. alongside general Rungu, who was obviously destroying teams um he was doing it in a different position mm -hmm. and there was this kind of generational Polynesians that were change in the game worldwide. Um, but he was just freakish, man. Freakish yeah, talent. Um, I love when he poked his fingers at all the Crusaders fans. Yeah, yeah. Love that. <laughs> yeah, and he sort of like challenged a lot of New Zealand psyche as well because there was the traditional 10 that wanted Murdens after Fox. Yeah. And then along came this dude from um, from a little town. Yeah, a little uh, Maori boy. Yeah, yeah, 18 <laughs> years old. Like Graham Henry picked him out to play for Auckland. And he's doing all of this stuff that was completely new and a lot of New Zealanders hated it, right? Like they wanted, it was always that Roots and Spencer thing and he challenged a lot of the New Zealand psyche. And uh, boy, yeah, bro, hell of a player. He was on my team in Gloucester as well. Like, yeah, man. Oh, so you played with him? Yeah, I played with him. It was, uh, it was different because he was like calling moves like from his Auckland days and we're like, <laughs> bro, I don't know that move, bro. I don't know that move, but um, it's still like he was in a, a Older, his older career, probably mid to late thirties, but still the perfect body. Yeah, you know, the, he's always been professional. It was good to see him coaching. Never like Reuters. I didn't like. Well, I saw that because I always bought like toffee pops because of that kind of. <laughs> yeah, you see, off like this. <laughs> that dude was selling it. They're not eating it. <laughs> that's a that's a drug dealer, but it's not the drug. You don't take it. So we got like him and speed. So we're moving on to uh, the fancier positions. The the superstars on the rugby field, the backs, outside backs. Uh, in, the, in the midfield, um, who do you have at your end? Yeah. <laughs> if anyone doesn't have Jonah Lumu, man, come on! It has to be Jonah Lumu. For me, easy. Jonah Lumu, the greatest of all time. Unbelievable. I didn't even need to say much. It's just Jonah Lumu. Yeah, Jonah Lumu. Um, um, have you met him? No, I haven't. I met him one time when I was doing um, work experience at New Orleans in mm. 2002, I believe. Um, and it's just like, I don't like, so in my line of work, when I worked in the TV, in TV in Australia and New Zealand, like I've met kind of like your perceived celebs. Mm. The only guys that I get nervous around and actually is, is, our, is our people. Mm. So it's either David Tua, Lakan, yeah. Jonah Lund, 
This is when I met him for the first time on Thursday. And so he came to New with him. And you know, saying, I think he came in for an interview or something. He was shaking everyone's hands and he went to shake my hand. And he was like, ah. Oh. Yeah. And he's like, hey, man. She's and like, like, like And then she looked me up. And then she looked me up because he's yeah. freaking 6'6", six, six, 120 mm -hmm. kilos. Um, gentle giant. He was always out in the community, which I love. Similarly, you talked about um, Joseph Parker always being yeah. a Samoa. Johnny, like you'd see him at Pacifica, like mm. just out and about, um, very accessible. But then again on the field, yeah, everyone was Jonah. Jonah was our oh, Michael Jordan. Yes, man. He was a he was the Michael Jordan. Yeah. What a player. Like with so many highlights. Mm -hmm. Even when he was a play for counties, like so many highlights where he's running from the twenty two all the way to the trial. And, um and that's why I don't really like Murdens. Like I'll never pick Murdens because he hardly gave the ball, bro. He had Jonah Lung, he had Jonah Lung on the wing against France and they lost that game. He touched the ball twice and scored twice. That's it. You know, like, like, like the heartbreak. Yeah, you know, like what, what, like the greatest player of all time, and I really like when like Richie McCall acknowledged that, and you know, everyone tried to talk him as the greatest player, but you know, he said, "Oh, it's Jonah for me, it's Jonah." That's cool that, like, because even like you've, you've seen a lot of all blacks, the old ones always kind of go yeah. back to jo uh, Jonah because, in some ways, well, in a lot of ways actually, um, he helped move the game for them to all have careers and global. Life. Global. America got interested. Everyone got interested. Europe got interested. You know, he was he was a draw card for everything and pushed it into professionalism. Mm. This started when he was in the Blues, 98, 99. Mm. You know, when him and Joey Vendieri. Yeah. Yeah, so. As County's Blues, eh? Jonah Lung. What's it? Is that the third young player that's died on our list? Shimmy Lanky, Jerry Collins. Him. Yeah. Probably just said. All right. Who's your number 12? I struggled here because mm -hmm. I raped myself. <laughs> I put myself in my own team. No. You can if you want. No, no, no. I, it's, talk that, talk that. <laughs> yeah. I like that guy, Halafanua. Is that his name? Halafanua. Oh, it's a, a Tonga dude. He played for the Hurricanes when they won it. Just remember that, guys. The like, Hurricanes won it when Ma Nunu and Connor Smith left. Then they won it the next year. Um, it was us. Wow, it was, it was when they left. I like his style, but I'd have to go with a, a guy that I watched in my childhood, uh, Jeremy Guscott. The child, he's so familiar. Yeah, he was the black rugby player for England. You guys remember? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Do you remember? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 He was 95 World Cup, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah I think so. Like, for me, he was a skillful all-rounder, uh, good running game, steps. Um, I, the 12, to me, has got to be an all-round player. Yeah. They have to be all-round. Back then, there were no hitters, though. There were no big hitters, but now because of Sam, Sam, um, Sam Tutupo, the uh, change of game, so 12s became big hitters. But I think um, that was my favorite player growing up, favorite 12. There was Johnny Shushta. Yeah, Randy Shushta. Yeah, Shushta and Stanley in the midfield. Yeah, so um, in terms of modern day game, I'll put Sonny Bill up there. Sonny Bill, Nunu was a great 12. Yeah. Yeah, I'll probably go Jimmy Guscott. I was gonna go uh, I'm not honest. Yeah. Um just just like a beast. Yeah. Just a beast. And um I love when these players I remember I remember back in that 2002, 2003 era where the media were writing him off, right? Mm. Because he was young and they played him for like one test and they were like, oh gap it. Mm. Um but I think that, and I don't know him personally, but maybe there was a conscious decision there. Because I remember when he was, you know, we're hating on him. Yeah. I remember they were saying that he couldn't crack it, he couldn't crack it at the international level, but he stayed around long enough. Because remember, they were playing him on the way. Yes. Uh, but he stayed around long enough to cement that position. He ended up playing 100 caps. Yeah. So I love that he kind of stuck to his guns. Yeah, and I hate how New Zealand do that. They always switch these centres to the wing, these Polynesian centres. Yeah. Like Caleb Clark was a centre for Mags. Uh, Ioana, Rico Ioana was centre for Auckland Grandma. Mm -hmm. And the Nanai Sutoru, is that kind of oh, yeah. yeah, so he was centre for St. Kent's, I think. You know, And they always get shifted out to the wing. But yeah, yeah, I don't like that. And when they did it with Mara, that was bullshit as well. Like midfielder his whole time and then a lot of play that I get to. Who's your 13? <sighs> Riku Iwane is close. Oh, wow. I love, that's the type of center that I, I like I would dream to be. It's mm. fast with steps. And he's he's got that. He's fast with steps. That's that's a, that's a modern day pick too. That's yeah. interesting. Him or Siru, Siru Rabini. I get it. Uh, 
with the hitting element, fast with steps as well, but it'll be a toss up between those two. Um, the player I'm picking kind of floated between a lot of positions, but he cemented himself in the midfield. Tanun, um, um, you might pick Tana. I, um, I had a friend that, that child, for, so you know when he came back after his retirement, right? And he came back, and I think he played a couple of games with the aunties or something. And I had a mate that went and went and trialed. <laughs> and he, because I was Tana coming back, and he's like, you know, near 40, you know, our mate went to go line him up and hit him. And he just went, dick, and he fell off. And he was like, shit, for an old fella, he's still my little man, he's still hard ass. But, it's all black. Um, but just beyond that, like, I love that he was the first someone to need the haka. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. And he, I, I wish he was around during that 2007 World Cup. Yes. Um, because prior to that, his run as a captain for Olympics, I thought was a pretty incredible. Um, and a lot of players were scared of him. Yes. But he, he um, I, I don't know, again, but I just think he um, stamped his authority on the game, but then also on his teammates really well, really well respected. No, absolutely. Another great captain. Yeah. Yo, yeah. no, nah, he, he was amazing. Good pick, bro. And I, I like that story about your mate going and trying to hit a mate. Well, he kind of figured, like, this yeah. is the, the OG. Mm. I'm going to try and get my, yeah. my uh, but that's one, in. Yeah, that's one thing I found about playing club rugby in New Zealand is that, you know, the, the dudes, they all target the All Blacks. Yeah. You know, and I love that. Like, this is an All Black. We're playing, we're playing this all. We're playing Carlos. We're playing um, Erony Clark. Mm. You hear the boys, bro, I'm going to smoke him. I'm going to smoke him. When I went to England, and we're playing like a, a full all black. They're like, oh, wow, wow, that's yeah, a bit of like amazement. Yeah, yeah, just of amazement. So now nah, that's what I love. That's what I love about here is that they don't care. But he got bumped. <laughs> uh, number fourteen, with Penny. Ah, it's my pick too. Has to be because he was eleven. But I was like, I can't. Yes. That that jersey belongs to Jonah. Oh, no. Yeah, Man. yeah, yeah. It's Jonah's jersey. Penny Rufin. No, unbelievable, unbelievable. Man. Even now he's. He, he, he was obese and he's still carving up man like yeah. he's unbelievable and his to hear the stories that the problems that he's gone through after rugby is really sad because he was man have you met him have you played no, no no lucky enough i haven't played against him yeah no but um as a player oh no i was just like it's he to me he was the human cheat code because you know when you're playing junior footy yeah. and there's always that one player that's going to score seven tries well, he was doing that as an adult versus all blacks wannabes. Yeah, pros against pros. And he was making them look stupid. Oh, unbelievable. Yeah. And he's got the, you've got that Fijian feel where they hand down the, yeah, yeah. Hand out the, <laughs> the reverse, like, a, like the backstroke. It's like a jujitsu move. <laughs> oh, he's unbelievable, man. And like that position, there's some great players, man. John yeah. Truwood, Doug Howlett. But he's one of like, I've, I've heard from actual players, they've all kind of rated him as like, if it's not Jonah, it's Rupini. Yeah. Like, I don't know Brian was just was saying that's that's the guy that we've always wanted on our team. Yeah. Like imagine having that like for midfielders, man. If you had Jono or him on the wing, yeah. Double miss. It's almost like give the ball to me, I'll score a try. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's it. Just support. You yeah. just run a support line and get something off him. But he was unbelievable, man. Uh, we're rounding up our team and uh we're finishing on our fifteenth number number fifteen, our fullback. When I was young, I really liked John Gallagher. I like him. Yeah, the redhead, and um, I really loved the way he played. But I will have to go with Mills and Mulyaina. Mm. And um, he was just so intelligent, you know, awesome link man. Silky smooth. Yeah, too. just really good at the quick hands and his positioning. People don't understand the positioning of a fullback and the importance of it to make sure you sweep up any kicks. Yeah. Um, but they did him dirty, bro, because he was on 99, 98 oh, tests. Cup, yeah, he was on 99, 98 tests, and, and then they, made. they held him back so Richie McCaw could get the 100 first. And that was some bullshit. That's a dog act. Bro, and if, if, if you don't think it's true, go have a look at it, bro. Then they bring him in the World Cup to play his, his 100. It's bullshit. Bro, but he amazing player. I remember playing him when he played for Calston. He yeah. scored a try and like ran over us and we're on the lying down and he looked at us and welcome to Calston. True? Yeah, bro. Welcome to Calston. Like, hey, aren't you from Southland? <laughs> like, okay. And that, that was the stack team, like all blacks, mostly two of E, Stephen Bates, him, Sam Tutapo. That was stacked. Yeah, man. And then um and then he went on to have a great career, so yeah. 
Yeah, man. And he's working in media now. So another, yeah. another player that's um, utilized his his athletic feats and traded into a career after life. Absolutely. And, and that should also be praised as well. Like, mm. if you think rugby is all you know and oh, I'm not good at anything else, then that's fine. Stay in it. Stay in it. I'm not saying that that's all he knows, but stay in it. And like, if you enjoy rugby, stay in it. Find, find somewhere in rugby that you can continue, whether, whether it's commentating or coaching, as a lot of players have done. You know, you don't have to like go back to nine to five and stuff. You know, there's heaps more avenues now and don't just invest in the playing side. And while you're playing, you can work on your commentary, get in front of your camera, work on your voice, yeah. you know, or work on your coaching while you're playing. Yeah, and I love that he stayed in it. And it, when you play 100 test matches, that's a wealth of knowledge. Mm -hmm. There's so much experience there that you can pass on. My 15 is uh, Christian Cullen, another also. <laughs> that was a bit of a hurricane squad you got there. What, you got Jonah, Ma'a. Jonah's from Auckland, man. And Come Jonah, Ma'a, Tana, and Christian Cullen. <laughs> but you left out Lomé. <laughs> I mean, Lomé, yeah, oh, Lomé. Don't worry with Lomé, I got you. <laughs> um, nah, Christian Cullen, uh, I guess pre this era was, yeah, just, just a normal mm -hmm. runner. Uh, that's my old soul from way back. <laughs> my Samoan brother. Yeah. He, my Uso. He just returned to Samoa too. Eh? He had yeah. a little documentary where he went back to see his family and reconnect. But just scary running ability. Like, again, similar to Cullen, I mean, to um, Spencer and Journal. That's, man, that whole, like, mid-90s, mid late 90s. Like, some of the players from then, phenomenal. It's phenomenal, bro. And you look at the rule changes. Like, back then... The fences had to were allowed to come up to the back of the scrum, yeah. so it was tighter. You had to run moves like it was harder for a backline. Now they're back five meters, you know. Like similar to rugby. Yeah, yeah. So, but to get these amazing players who were able to do everything before, you know, run their moves and that, and still have the legacy that they have, yeah. just imagine what the space that what they're given now. Sheesh, man. We've uh, picked out our fifteen, but I wanted to round this off. Is is there any player? from that era, from the 90s, that would easily just slot into now modern day? Because I know like we always talk about athletes growing and changing and getting stronger, faster. One, like there's two players that always stick out to me that will always do well in any generation. It's either Jenna or Rupini. Yeah, I agree. Um, but was there any players that you thought of that could kind of keep keep up with today's things? It's hard because you know, Wanga Tungamala, mm. back then he was seen as the bus. Or, yeah. you know, he's bowling over eight players. He was 102 kilograms. The average rugby player now is about 105. The average rugby player, like the, the midfielder is 100 kilograms. So it's really hard because yeah. back, like the professional now, any midfielder professional could probably be able to take him out. You know, because that generation wasn't fully professional. So it's hard to, I think Michael Jones could. Michael yeah. Jones could, yeah. He was just, he was something else. Um, but yeah, it's hard to compare now. It's just a different game. People mm -hmm. run a lot more in their bag. You know, there's a lot more skills now. They, are, uh, they lift a lot more. Sports science, they help. Yeah, massive, like the, the, the protein shakes and shit. Uh, yeah, the whole lifestyle. Back then, you know, they, were, they brought it back in now, but back then, they were, you know, all the beers and that were straight in the changing rooms. Yeah. Um, now you've got to take your omega-3s, you know, with your protein shake and all of this shit. You know, so it's a whole different era.